Good morning, and thank you so much for waking up with us here on Live Now from Fox. I'm Gina Francine, here with you for the next few hours to give you all of those breaking news alerts, top stories, and live events of your Tuesday morning. And as we come on the air, we are following breaking news, giving you a live look at this hour. There on your screen, you're getting a live look. Uh, Southern Israel looking into Gaza as we are following uh, this breaking news alert, learning that multiple deadly Israeli strikes have been reported overnight at a refugee camp in central Gaza. Well, joining us live this morning for the latest on the Israel-Hamas war is Independent Women's Forum Senior Fellow, Dr. Kanta Ahmed. Dr. Kanta, good morning to you. Truly a pleasure having you here on Live Now from Vox. A pleasure being with you, Janae. So if you could catch us up, please. We know this fight has been deadly on both sides. Uh, innocent Palestinian civilians, also innocent people in Israel. Yes, this conflict is uh, uh, possibly one of the most intense in Israel's history. It's certainly one of the longest. Um, and what we're seeing now is that Israel is intensifying operations, the critical stage being inside Rafah, where the remaining battalions of Hamas, the remaining brigades of Hamas are um, firmly um, uh, entrenched, but rapidly being degraded. I believe two battalions have already been destroyed. Rafah is the uh, city that is actually partly in Gaza and partly in Egypt, right on the border. And um, one of the interactions last night involved I Israel encountering 550 gunmen. So while we speak about Rafah as a place of refugees, remember most of the Palestinians have been re relocated from there to the humanitarian area, al Masawi, And so those that are remaining entrenched are Hamas operatives that are wanting to fight um, Israel. And my prediction is this probably will become much more intense as there is pressure on Israel to achieve a definitive uh, dismantling of Hamas because the war in the north is beginning to intensify. That's the war with Hezbollah. Absolutely. We've spoken in recent weeks about those projectiles that have been seized there at the border with Lebanon. I want to ask you with your expertise in this, you know, many people looking at Israel and Hamas and hoping that some ceasefire agreement will come down. But in the midst of this, there's also the potential of a declaration of war with Hezbollah. Uh, how does that affect both sides? So uh, briefly about the ceasefire, the United States has taken a very clear position that it wants the ceasefire to be declared without really solving the underlying problem, which is what to do about the remnants of Hamas. If Hamas is not completely dismantled without and left without an ability to reassemble, we will see this war repeated very soon in, in, in a matter of a, a couple of years. And so that's not been addressed not only by the United States. Calls for ceasefire have also uh, now arisen from the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, the future monarch of Saudi Arabia, who last night uh, mentioned this at the end of the Muslim pilgrimage to all of the world's Muslim leaders, that it was time for a ceasefire. But both these uh, superpowers in, in the region, the United States here, and of course, uh, Saudi Arabia in the Middle East, are not recognizing that there can be no peaceful future without dismantling of Hamas. Now, Hezbollah is a completely different animal than Hamas. It is the world's most powerful, violent, uh, non-state actor. It has an arsenal that could, could be very similar to what Russia was able to do to Ukraine in the beginning of that war. So this is extremely uh, uh, devastating, well beyond devastation to Israel. Also, Lebanon itself is powerless. It is a vassal to Tehran. The Lebanese foreign minister, uh, it has expressed in January this year hopes that Hezbollah is not dragging itself into a war. So the Lebanese government doesn't have power over Hezbollah. It doesn't have power to declare war, and Lebanon doesn't have power to make peace. And so this is a dilemma for Israel. Is it going to go after Hezbollah assets, or is Israel going to actually have to also target Hezbollah's civilian works, Hezbollah supplies water and other vital um, services that the government fails to do for southern Lebanon. So this is a much more complex, much more dangerous conflict. And while the United States wants to contain the conflict, frankly, for selfish reasons, for the electoral cycle, rather than for humanity, we are going to see that this war has already spilled over elsewhere into the region.
Absolutely. Another concern this morning, Dr. Conta, is what we've been hearing uh, for several months. Uh, pressure on Netanyahu. What is the post-war plan? Once that ceasefire, well, let me say if and when that ceasefire agreement is signed by both sides, then what? If we're being honest, there was a humanitarian crisis before October 7th when we discussed post-war plans. What will happen for Israel? What will happen for the Palestinian people? There hasn't really, uh, a plan hasn't really been given. So I, I, I do understand that. And I am uh, someone in absolutely in favor of a stable uh, Palestinian state in the future. Uh, I don't think that there is a possibility for doing that now. If we create a Palestinian state, as Spain, Norway, and Ireland have been calling for, and many other nations have been calling for, that is granting a state to Hamas. That is guaranteeing that there will be future proxy wars. Israel would be reduced to a proxy left to fight wars against Hezbollah and Hamas constantly. So that is not acceptable, and that does not engender peace for the Palestinian people either. Um, so thinking about the day after is very important. In some ways, it's also premature, and there can be no plan for the day after without the world getting involved in guaranteeing security. In terms of humanitarian crisis, it, of course the people in Gaza are suffering. Of course the Palestinian people in su are, are suffering. But there's been a tremendous amount of humanitarian aid. By April, almost 240,000 trucks of aid has gone in. Um, there is uh, adequate um, uh, food being distributed, but difficulty with access. And much of that is because of the corruption of Hamas. In this conflict in Rafa, Israel has just recently uncovered 200 tunnel shafts. 25 of them extremely long, going into the state of Egypt, most likely, where Hamas continues to rearm even in this condition. So yes, uh, the Israeli government is in this impossible position of fighting a war on two fronts while planning a humanitarian future for the people uh, that are being mercilessly persecuted by its own enemy. This is also an, a terrible irony. But I think the world has to address that this is a deep entrenched war that is going to need very serious engagement. That doesn't mean that Israel can't fight it alone. Israel can fight it, but it needs tremendous international support. And while I am very much with the position of Saudi Arabia calling for a peaceful end, a Palestinian state, dignity for the Palestinian people, just as there should be dignity of the Israeli people. Remember, there are 80,000 Israelis internally displaced from the northern border, and there is food insecurity inside Israel for those families that are displaced without work, without food, without shelter. So it, both populations are suffering with humanitarian uh, needs. Uh, but for Saudi Arabia to be realistic, for there to be a Palestinian state, we do have to address both Hamas and Hezbollah, and that means confrontation with Iran. Dr. Kanta, I always enjoy your candidness and expertise on these international topics. Thank you so much for waking up bright and early to join us here on Live Now from Fox. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Anything myself and the viewers need to be keeping a close eye on? My hope is that the United States would come to its senses. It's so discouraging when we see our own international leaders more focused on an election campaign than what's happening in the world today, not only this conflict. We're seeing today uh, uh, Putin is traveling to North Korea. That means Putin is continuing to pivot away from the West. We're seeing Saudi Arabia entering into and getting closer to the BRICS nations. We're seeing the entire world moving away from uh, the, the, the Western conflagration. And there seems to be no reaction. There seems to be no functioning uh, engagement to prevent this happening. And all of that will lead to increasing isolation of the United States and reduction in U.S. influence, which is a dangerous, dangerous development. Even though there's a lot of optimism about the United States and Saudi pact, that would be the first U.S.-Arab security pact of that degree between the two nations, and it seems to be very much contingent on creating a Palestinian state, that's a shortcut. These conflicts have to be addressed. There's an urgent need to de-escalate the Russia-Ukraine war. That's very important. There's an urgent need to counter this growing American isolation. And I think what we're seeing in Israel and Palestine is the manipulation of China, Russia, and Iran to begin to drag the United States into a protracted Middle Eastern conflict, which will distract America from China's pivot away. 
So there is so much to be done, much more than winning an election. Sometimes we want our leaders not to think about their own political future, but to think about the future of humanity. Dr. Kansa, wise words there. Thank you so much for joining us bright and early. Again, we appreciate your perspective and expertise. You enjoy the rest of your day.